What's going on, David? What's up, bro? How you doing? Oh, well, good, good, good. Well, you're good. a busy guy. Appreciate you pulling up. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Good to be here. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Bridge Builder Conversation, it's all about getting to know the people. Right. Um, getting to know the humans as we all are from your journey, your story, and what's led into your career. But also, most importantly, for what I'm doing is making a connection for myself in this mm -hmm. conversation as well as others how what you do actually brings people together mm -hmm. creates opportunity access for others as i call it bridge building. so mm -hmm. really looking forward to you know the dialogue today absolutely same yeah. here same here good stuff man yeah, so, good to be here yeah man so let's let's actually start at the beginning so let's rewind back okay where does damien begin ah man uh beginning that's funny uh as i approach my 50th birthday, I'm learning that. Congratulations. You know, uh, you made it, yeah, you yeah, made it, yeah, yeah, you yeah, made it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the beginning is, it seemed like there was, you know, I've always been, right? Okay. So, uh, uh, but from my memory, I remember being born in Buffalo, New York. That's, that's what I remember. Uh, my mom is originally from Memphis. My father is from Buffalo and, uh, so I was born and raised in Buffalo, New York. Okay. Uh, started in the industry of cutting hair. We started, uh, me and my brother, I got a twin brother. We started cutting hair. As we can remember, it had to be around 11 or 12 years old. Okay. You know, it's, it's, we don't remember not cutting hair. Right. So, you know, we've always cut hair for the most part. Uh, my mom was a stylist. So we grew up in it, watching my mom cut it, do hair at the house. Mm -hmm. So many people coming to the house, getting their hair done. So we've always been in that, you know, that environment where people came to our home and she made them feel good and look good. So it was a natural, you know, uh, feeling for us gotcha. in, the, in the hair industry. So from, from that time, all through grade school, high school and college, we cut hair. No, you grew up around hair. Yeah, Your mom did hair. I don't remember when you started. Um, interesting. So, but then I have this hat on. You see my line. You know what I, mean? I see a little. So, I see that line up. So, my, my, my boy helped me with this. One. Okay, I did. But I cut hair. I'm trying to think. I had to be in middle school, mm -hmm. um, and it's pretty much you know couldn't afford to go to the barber shop as often as I was. Like, right. Let me let me pull out some curls. That's right. I don't know how to fade. I can do a, a even, uh -huh. Uh -huh. edge it up. Yep. But uh, no, that's dope, man. Yeah, that's dope. Yeah. dope, dope. Yeah. So. Other than, I guess, the, I guess, cutting hair, mm -hmm. your mom styling, what was your family like? What was that? Uh, for you? So my mom, uh, my mom was married previously before she met my, my father. Okay. Uh, my father was married previously before he met my mother. Okay. So, uh, you know, they met up and neither one of them wanted to have children because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. they had previous children and, and previous marriages. And, but my mom always wanted to have a boy and she ended up having two. She ended up having two boys and here we are. Yeah, uh, but for the most part, I grew up, uh, my mom, my father was around. They married later on. They didn't stay married long, but the family was always there. So we had a tight family. Uh, we was exposed to a lot of different things within our community. Uh, our family was pretty well known. My grandfather was a very established, uh, you know, businessman, and he just, our family was known for just working hard in the community. So, you know, we've always been in that type of environment. You know, I've seen everything, you know, so as a family, you know, I've seen everything from, you know, hustlers to, you know, drug users to, you know, hardworking people. You know what I'm saying? Sure. People who went to work every day. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, with that environment, you know, being born in the 70s, growing up in the 80s, you can imagine, you know, especially the, you know, the, the 80s, you know, uh, you know, certain things started to inflict our communities. Sure. Uh, so we experienced that uh, just in our community. You know, we actually saw the transition of, of families changing and, and uh, the 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 violence starting to happen in 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 the early '90s and stuff really at another level. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so we we were able to have those experiences and and learn how to you know navigate in those sure. waters. Uh, so by the time we get to you know high school age, you know we, we're probably not the average you know high schoolers at that time because you've seen mm -hmm. a lot and uh, you know uh, and so you're moving a little different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that that was. But overall, family experience, uh, you know, if we were poor, I didn't know it. I don't, I, I don't think, I, I, we was never in that state of mind. We never yeah. felt, you know, deprived of anything. You know, the things we wanted, we got. Yeah. Uh, so we, my mom was not a strict, she was she was a disciplinary, but she wasn't strict. Mm -hmm. uh, she allowed us to, to, you know, to discover ourselves and discover our talents and gifts. Uh, if we wanted to go to college, that was cool. If we did want to go to college, that was cool. Uh, but she just allowed us to kind of figure things out. No, and so um, I'm thinking about, again, growing up in an entrepreneurial household. Mm -hmm. Your parents got their things, they do their things. Yeah. Um, and how that in, may have influenced you Absolutely. in the path you took. Uh, and I just, I wonder how, as you mentioned again, the 80s leading to the 90s, so I'm born in the 82. Mm -hmm. um, I guess 90s is more of my coming of age mm -hmm. uh, or decade. Mm -hmm. And I always wonder, um, I mean, my, my belief and my faith very much informs a lot of this, but I always love to hear stories about, you know, people's journey. Mm -hmm. Like, no, we were in the same place. Oh, yeah. But for some reason, this is my journey. This is your journey. This yeah. is your journey. And I don't, I do believe part of it is, um, if you want to say fake or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, this was predestined or whatever, but I also believe some of it is uh, based on your surroundings and yeah. just what you absorbed and what you knew yeah. um, to be life. Yeah. So for you growing up in that, in that, in those times, what would you say contributed to making you, you as you grew into a teenager and moved out of high school, what would you say was like very impactful to you making it through yeah. those years? So the faith part, so it's, it's funny that when I think about that part of our lives, my mom, by the time I was aware of anything, my mom was uh, heavily in, in, the, in the Jehovah Witness, okay. that, that part of her faith. And so we were a part of that mm -hmm. in our early stages. Gotcha. And so I remember, I remember, you know, knocking on doors. I remember sitting in strange people's living rooms and having discussions about, gotcha. you know, Jehovah and you know the path to, you know, you know to that. Sure. And uh, and I remember the, the divide that her and my father had because my father grew up in as a Baptist. You know okay. what I'm saying? I remember that divide. I remember hearing, you know, those those conversations of mm. why we didn't celebrate certain things and gotcha. you know my father wasn't down with that so I remember those type of things uh so I mean I think I think being in the middle of that mm -hmm. you know as you're growing up you you start to you can see how uh religion can divide a sure. family you yeah. know what I'm saying can divide even your own your own self because you you conflicted in different sure. things and I probably want to say that that whole process uh, had us in a place of observing uh, instead of participating. Hmm. You know, we took the position, let's observe this because we've seen it divide us. Sure. So let's just take a look at what this really is. And uh, again, my mom was, she was open, especially when we get, became of age. So by the time we got teenagers, you know, you when you see the, the divide and it's like, it's hard to tell me to, I'm not going to, I can't sure. go to the Kingdom Hall. I can't do that right now. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. can't even be with my father right now. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm not understanding none of this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't add up. So, you know, as you know, again, I have to give my mom credit because she allowed us to kind of step away and make our own decisions. And so, you know, now I think that's the beauty of, of, of parenting you know when you can allow your child to at, at some point be independent of even of you mm -hmm. and i think that that gave us that that space to kind of grow as young men 
and uh, as a family, we start becoming very. And when you can, when you can challenge God, you don't have no problem challenging anybody else. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm so yeah, that was that was part of us navigating, and then you go into entrepreneurship, which is totally against a lot of, uh, you know, you know, traditional thinking, because you got to really start to think outside the box to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And we were entrepreneurs really early on. You know, we was we were fixing bikes. We were uh, you know. Uh, paper boys. We were, you know, we were doing anything that kind of had entrepreneurial aspirations very early. You know, cutting grass, mm. shoveling the snow. You know, we, it was nothing to us. Like, that was just part of it. And you feel like that just came naturally because of Nat your parents. And it was just natural. You saw it all the time. What people call hard work, you don't call hard work. You just, I don't, you know, even when it I is. hear it today, I like, I don't even understand what you're talking about. It's just, it, it just is what it is. No. Yeah, no, that's, that's something. Um, so my, my grandfather owns a construction business. And when I was younger, pretty much the way I tell it, like as soon as we could walk as mm -hmm. grandchildren, we mm -hmm. were working with them. Mm -hmm. Whether it's picking up uh, trash or whatever it was with the construction company. And I remember when I, what brought me to Charlotte was school, study multimedia web design. When I got my first job out of school, how would I say? I felt like I was lazy. Mm -hmm. I was sitting in a chair all day. Mm -hmm. Okay. I felt le like legit yeah. inside. Yeah. I was like, man, I feel like I should be doing more. Right. Because I was just used to this, I want to call it blue collar work. Mm -hmm. Like, no, you're grinding, you're sweating. Mm -hmm. If you're not sweating, mm -hmm. you ain't really working type right, deal. Right. Um, but no, that's, yeah, it's, I, I guess it's just your conditioning. Yeah, you know, it's just conditioning. It's an exercise. Sure. It's a muscle mm -hmm. that you build. Sure. And you just, that's just what it is. No, no, that's great. That's great. That's great. So how about we transition again, how you grew up, your influences, your family dynamics, the entrepreneurial aspect in which you grew up in. It sounds silly even to ask, like, how, how did you land where you are? Mm -hmm. Like, no, I can look at your story. Right, that, right. It makes perfect sense. Right. But unfold that for me. Like, how, where did No Grease start? Um, mm -hmm. For you and your brother, it started. Uh, we probably was in, we were probably late high school that time, going into college. So he had got my brother got accepted to uh, Alfred University on a full scholarship, uh, engineering scholarship, graphic engineering. Uh, I had got accepted to Johnson C. Smith, and we knew we wanted to open up a business, a barbershop, because mm -hmm. we had cut hair for so long, but. At that age, like we'll get to that when we sure. get to it. Gotcha. Let's explore this other stuff. And so, uh, just the way you're talking about it and the way y'all thinking at mm -hmm. that age is, is right. dope. You know what I mean? Right, 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 right. That's yeah. And again, you having and you know, I'm, I'm exploring the dynamics of having a twin as well. Yeah. I'm assuming that that's a, probably a lot tighter. Yeah. Being that you had a twin. So let me go back Johnson. to that twin part. You know, the twin part is as I've gotten older, mm -hmm. is a special little. Uh, experience in life because okay. I don't know what it is to be alone sure I've always had somebody around to talk to mm -hmm. and they look like me you know sure. what I'm saying and we shared some of the same ideals and, and and we can you know play off each other sure you know I've had that my whole life so I don't even know what that thing Not is that. that other people have that person had always been there and so you move, you know, so when you start to do, I, you know, entrepreneurial things, you got somebody in you your got a corner, that's a, a different, part. <laughs> that's a different experience. I don't, I don't know what that is not to have. Sure. You know? uh, so as we are thinking about even, so we, the first time we separated was when we went to college. Hmm. That was the first, he was in New York, I was in North Carolina. Hmm. And we totally just didn't even think about each other like that. We would call each other every now and then, and, uh, you know, I, he was in Alfred University, you know, you know, cutting hair. So uh, what they call him now? Uh, what they call him? What's a PWI? What they, that's a oh, private white institution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. he's he's in he's a, he's a prompt. He's predominantly mm -hmm. he's like one out of, you know, maybe 100 black guys on the campus. Sure. He's cutting hair. The basketball team is all white with one one black guy, mm -hmm. you know. He's exploring, he's, he's never dealt with uh, white women, right. you know, you think about dating white women and, you know, all this. so he's dealing with that, you know, and we wasn't really exposed to that in our mm -hmm. environment. I'm down at John C. Smith, sure. 
They don't get no blacker than John C. Smith. <laughs> and I'm having that experience. Sure. I'm cutting the football team and everybody's black. You know what I'm saying? Sure. And, you know, and we're having these discussions. That, that was the discussions that we would have. Hmm. Like, yo, I'm cutting a lot of hair. Like, yeah, I'm cutting a lot of hair down here too. Gotcha. You know, so now the, the wheels are turning about what, what we're going to do next. He decides that he doesn't want to finish school. He, he's not having the experience that he wants to have. Sure. And, you know, he decides to go back home and go to a community college. And I'm like, I'm having a ball at John C. Smith. <laughs> I'm not coming home sure. no time soon. Oh, I got to do these four years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he decides to go to community college and work in a barbershop. And he's starting to do his thing. He's, he's growing. Mm -hmm. He's, what, 19, 20. He's, he's, he's making money. He's doing his thing, cutting hair. He's really having that experience. I'm at John C. Smith, I'm cutting hair, but I'm going, I'm in school. I'm, I'm sure. focused on school, trying to really get my, be the first one to graduate. Cause I would have been, I was, I was the first one to graduate from college. Okay. Dope. And so I'm focused like, yo, that, that'll happen when it's supposed to happen. And we just started playing with the idea of what this, what this business would look like. Cause mm -hmm. he's doing so well up there. I would go home for the holidays and I would go to the shop and I will work just for, for the holidays sure. with him. And I'm looking at the, you know, the, the type of money he's making at this age. He, he, he wouldn't got his own apartment. So I'm seeing all of what can be happening sure. if I wasn't, you know, if I wasn't in school. Mm -hmm. But he encouraged me to stay in school. He actually would shoot me some money every now and then, make sure I was good. Yep. And, uh, you know, that was kind of the makings and the unfolding of, uh, of the, uh, the whole, seriousness of, of barber. Actually my my uh was it my freshman year? Probably my freshman year. Uh I was cutting hair in the dorm, but I was looking for a job too. Mm -hmm. So I was cutting hair <clears throat> and I was looking for a job. So I went job hunting with one of my uh he's now my frat brother, but right. at the time we was just freshmen at college and uh I went job hunting when we we filling out applications at, you know, McDonald's and everywhere. He's like, yo, why are you, why are you, <laughs> you making, you making a killing cutting hair at, sure. at the campus? Why are you? And I sat back and thought about that. I said, you are right. And I never even thought about filling out another application again. Wow. It's like, yo, let me, let me focus. And, sure. uh, and that's kind of when everything kind of just started okay. really saying, okay, this is what we'll be doing. So you, you graduated from Johnson C. Smith. Yep. Um, how long did it take before y'all launch No Grease? Graduated from John C. Smith in 95. We launched Snow Grease in 97. My brother moved down from Buffalo in 95. We worked at the local shop, mm -hmm. Mr. Gordon's, for two more years. And then we launched Snow Grease. Dope, dope, dope. Yeah. No, that's cool. So help help me understand the heart behind, because it's from afar, No Grease isn't just a shop. Right. You know I mean? Right. Come get a chair, cut some heads. Yeah, um, it's more than that. So I love to understand the heart behind it mm -hmm. and more of your vision for No Grease and its existence. Yeah, the heart. So a lot of things. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll start with the name and the logo. Okay. Right? Those two keep us very focused on why we started No Grease. Uh, so I'll start with the the name first. The name came before the logo. So no grease at the time, you gotta remember the 80s and 90s. Sure. People wore a lot of grease in their hair, Dax, Murray's grease, and Murray's? they would pack that, pack that grease in their hair. <laughs> sure. And then they'd try to come get a haircut. And I'm like, man, listen, I can't cut your hair with all this grease in your hair. Sure. So we literally used to have a sign that said no grease in your head before getting your hair cut. Hmm. And it became kind of catchy. Uh -huh. and gotcha. All the barbers knew that, you know, barbers understood that. Sure. So it was catchy, no grease. That's hard to forget that name. And then the logo came from my brother. He wrote, he uh, took a uh, uh, he took a uh, a black theater class okay. at Alfred University, and they talked about the minstrel show. Mm -hmm. And he was in this play and all this stuff about blackface and sure. those type of things. And he dug a little deeper and found out what was the makeup that they were wearing. And it was actually a black grease that they would put on their face before performing. Hmm. They would take a corkscrew and burn it and it would become this black pasty grease. And then they would put the grease on their face. Hmm. And for those who don't know about blackface, it's when 
white and black performers would do satire. Sure. Uh, really mimicking black people images. Sure. And we are totally about positive images of, of not only black people, but people as a whole. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the that's the symbol of, you know, people who want to dig a little deeper sure. into your crease. Sure. Uh, that's the symbolism. We like, we're in your face. We're not going to be shucking and jiving. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be stepping and fetching for you. We're going to be black men. We're going to be men. And we're going to do business in such a way that uh, it's excellence. Mm -hmm. No. It's definitely, I mean, I get, I remember the grease. I used to do the Murray's. Mm -hmm. Give away, give away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't pack it like that though. I right. seen some people that's packed it and it's like, bro, right. what are you right. doing? Um, but even to the the logo mm -hmm. and blackface, it's very much a logo that catches your attention. It's like, what's, what's going on exactly? Right. And to hear the story behind it. And even before I heard the story, story about it, and observing your shot again, even you right now, mm -hmm. bow tie, mm -hmm. the way you dress, mm -hmm. um, and the black excellence mm -hmm. that you aim to portray within your business mm -hmm. is dope and makes sense when it comes to the logo. Yeah, it's like no, nah, this is not what we're doing. Yeah, we're about the opposite. So that's cool. That's real cool, man. Um, so <laughs> what is it? Uh, I'm always interested. Are you you a big music person? I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty well versed. Okay, yeah, yeah. all right. So, producer, recording artist, myself, mm -hmm. and I I just find that I learn a lot about people mm -hmm. by learning a little bit about their their musical taste or mm -hmm. their art. Taste. Mm -hmm. So, if you had to say favorite song or the song that's on repeat right now, Ooh. what is that Ooh. that would speak to me about who Damien is Ooh. right now? Come on. The 50 year old Damien? Uh man. The last song you say though, you can go back. I mean the Buffalo last, Damien. Not, I mean, so the last song really that I've been kinda in rotation is uh uh God Did with uh with uh DJ okay. Khaled. Yep. And uh so you got you know, you got Lil Wayne, you got uh what's my Rick Ross Rick Ross mm -hmm. and you got Jay Z. Sure. And really Jay Z verse is the one that I keep in rotation. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I thought when you break down that verse, man, that's that's pretty been that's been my journey. So uh yeah, yeah. That that's where I'm at right now. Gotcha. Yeah. I feel yeah. that. And I can to see that. to see the fifty two year old Jay Z mm -hmm. evolve into that person, uh, and to be in the industry for as long as he's been in, mm -hmm. that's me. You know what I'm saying? I've been gotcha. in the barbering game for thirty years. I still got young barbers who think they could take me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I, I had to get next to him, let them know, yeah, I can still cut hair, you know? Gotcha. Uh, so I, I think that's that's that would be where I am right now. Gotcha. Yeah. Dope. Same here, man. That, again, I feel like Jay-Z, I think he's always, he's been a, an artist that I pay attention to throughout mm -hmm. the years, mm -hmm. but as he gets older, yeah. and to see his, how he evolves, yeah. it's very intriguing to me. Yeah. Um, when you talk about giving the cheat codes, it's like, no. Yeah. Listen, listen. Yeah, I take it. I take it even a step further. Jay Z. So again, remember, I'm, I, I, when I think about my journey, okay, born in the seventies. When I, I think about, okay, born in seventy two. Uh, I think King had just King was just killed four years before I was born. Okay. Him, Malcolm. Kennedy, mm -hmm. all these guys. Then I think about some of my other heroes, whether it be Bruce Lee, uh, uh, Bruce Lee, uh, all the younger, and most of these guys were they were gone before sure. forty. Sure, they were they were gone. And so to see somebody else that you kind of have some aspirations or admire mm -hmm. at fifty two still going, we haven't seen that. Sure, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I like uh, I'm a generation that all our heroes. They were dead mm -hmm. by the time I was, you know, we was looking back what they had did 20 years ago. We had no relevant heroes at the time that was as big as the Kings and the Malcolms and sure. the people that they was putting in front of us. Hmm. Uh, so uh, now being 50, 49, I'm, I'm claiming my 49, I'm not 50 yet. <laughs> being 49 and still having people your age still be relevant that's important bro oh, absolutely even as you're saying that he's like and not to 
you know, ping on the bridging aspect, but very much there has been a gap mm-hmm. when it comes to that. Mm-hmm. Um, even as you talked earlier, when it comes to family structure mm-hmm. during a certain period of time within the, within the inner city, the black community. Um, no, absolutely. I see that. And that's that's like critical. And it's, uh, this actually makes sense in transitioning into, I would love to understand, again, from a vision perspective, you have a school, and you have your shops, yeah. and we have a mutual friend in Mike Shelton. And I know his story yeah. of his journey, you know what I mean? And where he is right now. So I would love to learn more about that. But before we get there, just again, from being able to see, Mm -hmm. not just hear, Mm -hmm. you can do this, but actually be able to look Mm -hmm. at you, to be able to look at a Jay-Z or Mm -hmm. whomever it is at a stage of life. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's super important. And for certain communities, not having that mm-hmm. obviously is detrimental to the absolutely. growth and the progression of the community. When you talk about um, what is it uh, worth within mm-hmm. within the black community mm-hmm. um, and versus the white community, it's mm-hmm. like there's hundreds of thousands of a difference okay. when it comes there, and I think it's largely due to not being able to see that right. within our community for various reasons yeah. that. How would I say we did not decide upon, mm-hmm. but were oppressed upon this, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, as well as some internal dealings as well. So, no, I very much feel you on that. Um, but to transition into the school, your mm-hmm. vision for like, I, again, if I had to sit back, I see no no grease as kind of a um, I don't want to say a workshop, but it's very much you enter, mm-hmm. but how you exit yeah. or how you continue the aim is enough that you're you, there's a progression there's a growth yeah. there's an elevation um and i think it's a perfect time for to bring in my other guest yeah. jason so let's go ahead and welcome him into conversation come on jay so welcome to the conversation jason. thank you thank you for having me i appreciate it absolutely my pleasure Appreciate you pulling up. I hit you up randomly. Um, yeah, it was really in the random. Yeah, you know, a little random. I told you it was random in yeah, the message. You, know? you did, you did. <laughs> exactly. But as I, again, um, I'm not sure. Do you know Mike Shelton? I, I know the name. I feel like. He, he was before you. Yeah. yeah. Mike, uh, Arkansas. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah he yeah, actually yeah. went uh, to the church that I go to. So oh, no. No. I heard of him before I even knew who he was. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. So talking to you about him, and obviously you know him, yeah. and like we go, Mike Sheldon, we go back years performing together. Mm. Like I remember putting wow. together a tour, and he was a part of that tour, and I knew his wife, you know, his son. Mm-hmm. So it's dope one to see his journey. Yeah. And um, at that time, I didn't know much about No Grease. Yeah. You know, but the more I talked to him and see how he's progressing now, back in Arkansas, having shots and things of that nature, it's like, yeah. That's dope. Yeah. And I like the, and again, I'm gonna let you tell it, like the model and your vision and your hopes. Like yo, if you enter, whether it's a Jason or whom it is, like I wanna, I wanna take you from here to here. Yeah. But if you could share a little bit about that, yeah, I definitely wanna hear some of Jason's story. Yeah, the school, man, the school, we, we did that out of uh, necessity, right? Okay. You know, we was trying to grow a business, a uh, barbershop business, but the talent wasn't there. You know, mm-hmm. we just couldn't get the type of talent that we wanted to work in our shops. You know, we did some research. We talked to some barber schools and they didn't seem, you know, responsive in the way that we thought they should be. Sure. And so we said, you know what, we're going to open up our own school. Mm-hmm. And so that was the first way. It was out of necessity. But once we got in it and we saw the individuals that we was working with and how it was changing lives, then it became something bigger. I was. It's funny, I didn't mention it. I was in ministry before, you know what I'm really? saying? I, was, uh, I actually was uh, uh, associate minister, minister at a, a University Park with uh, Claude Alexander. So I was in the ministry and I was like, you know, I was kind of battling that, you know, what, what does this ministry thing look like? Do I get sure. behind the pulpit or do mm-hmm. I stay behind the chair? Gotcha. And so I battled that. And then I said, well, this is my ministry. You know, it is the barber industry is my ministry. Mm. And so the school was a good opportunity for us to get, you know, people in the beginning stages and begin to kind of work with them and and see, use this whole vehicle of barbering to get them to where they say they want to go. And so we could be 
hardly their inception in the business. And so, you know, not only working, you know, and, and, and because of, unfortunately in our, in our society, everything becomes black and white, right? So you, Explain. you know, you start thinking you're doing something for black people. Okay. Right. But at the end of the day, you're doing something for people, people. you know, sure. and, and, you know, but we can only take our experiences. That's the only thing you got. If you only work with black people, then that's the only mm -hmm. experience you got. If you only sure. work with white people, that's the only experience sure. you got. So the school allowed us to open up because it was, it was, it was opening up to anybody who wanted to cut hair. Cut, yeah. And everybody who has that desire, you know, that's anybody. Sure. Uh, so that started to open us up more in the sense that we were reaching more people, you know, of all walks of life. We was learning more about ourselves. We was learning more about our community. And so the school just opened up this whole platform to, to really help, you know, people get to where they were going, mm -hmm. you know, and you can use this barbering industry to get you there, you know? Uh, so that's what the whole uh, thing was. So when we were getting these young guys and seeing them kind of, you know, their lives being changed, we knew our background, so it was it was it was amazing because you're meeting people that you met your whole life. Sure, you know what I'm saying. Now yeah. it makes sense. Now my journey makes sense. I'm like, gotcha. oh, I, I dealt with these. This is what I dealt with my whole life. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so when you would meet people, they could be you know second chance. They could be drug addicts. They could be killers. You know, like oh, I, I met you before. I seen you before. You know what I'm saying. I know the side of you that most people don't know. That you know, I know your grandma. You know, like, so before you did that, made that bad decision, sure. I remember when you was in being loved by your family. Sure. So we can look at our community with a, with a, with a more of a, you know, empathize and sympathize with them because I'm like, I know you, I, I, I know you well, you know? So, so that was, uh, that the school has been such a, uh, uh, that, that place for us that we, I mean, and even though we only have one school, we probably should have more schools than we have shops, sure. but. It's a, it takes a, a different level of commitment to the school. That's interesting, and you made me think about another Jay quote um, and how I envision what you, how you describe what you're doing. This idea of I put my brothers on, my brothers put their brothers on. That's right. right. That's that's yeah. super dope, man. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you, the way you talk about it, it's a vehicle, but there's a, a bigger purpose oh, yeah. for that vehicle. Yeah. Um, no, that's dope. So I, I love to hear, I guess, some of your journey within, did you go to the school? Yeah. So, okay, dope. Yeah, so, um, November of 2016, okay. I came home from prison. All right. Okay. Um, two days later, that was a Thursday, Pardon me. Monday, I went to the school because I knew that's why my next step was coming home from prison. They were closed, oh, right? <laughs> so I was, I was like, hey, okay. Well, I'm, I'm just in such a hurry to get this thing going and, mm -hmm. and, and that desire to, you know, get life rolling and, and, and getting into the school because I knew that was my next step. Um, how, did, how did you know that was your next step? just kind of touching in on the faith that y'all was talking about earlier. Okay. So, you know, when I was in prison, I just, I mean, I really just started having these real strong impressions to just start learning how to cut hair. I didn't grow up, like he grew up cutting hair his whole life. You know what I mean? I didn't start cutting hair until I got to prison. Okay. And so um, through that journey right there, um, it, was, it, was, it was wild. Cause at one, one camp I was at, one prison I was at, some volunteers that came in there and they had said that um, no Grease works with, um, you know, felons and, and people coming from prison. They, they, they do scholarships and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I knew who No Grease was. I've been in Charlotte a very, okay. very long time, sure. most of my life. And so I've always seen them around. I, you, you know, you can't miss them. Gotcha. And so um, I was like, oh, yeah. I know, I know who No Grease is, you know what I mean? I, I know where they at. And so I always had that in the back of my mind. Like I already knew that's why I needed to go mm -hmm. to go to school. And so even like the, the confirming prayer of that was on that Monday when I went to the school and it was closed, mm -hmm. you know, I got my man driving me around because I, I don't got no vehicle, I don't sure. got nothing yet. And so, and I'm like, well, let me go check out this other school that's, that's up the way, mm -hmm. right? And immediately, you know, I could sense you know, the Lord speaking to my heart, like, ain't no need. Mm. I told you to start here. Mm. 
And so, and that's what I did. So I came back the next day, gotcha. right? <laughs> and I met um, his sister. Yeah. yeah. And then I met um, Charlie, who is, no. um, you know, another huge part of No Grease and, yeah. and where it is today. And so- um, He's the third partner, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, so when I got in there, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to find some information. You know, his, his sister's, she was very hard, standoffish a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. especially you get you get a lot of riffraff coming in and out of the yeah, school. Right. Right. So you gotta have that, you know, not that wall up, so to speak, just to mm -hmm. know how to deal with people. Mm -hmm. And so I'm asking questions for for sincere information, so I know what to do. And she's like, you gotta go do this first. You gotta go do this first. And I'm like, all right, so I gotta do what? That, all right, so let me just leave because I see this ain't going nowhere and I'm gonna go get this stuff you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And, um, but Charlie pulled me to the side before I left and he was like, you know, you, you know how to cut hair already? He was like, you know, he could kind of see it on me because Charlie kind of comes from yeah. that too. So, mm -hmm. and he, and I mean, he just called me out on He was like, you know, you look like you just came home from somewhere. And, mm -hmm. and I'm like, yeah, just <laughs> fresh out. <laughs> I need this, I need this. Gotcha. And, um, and so, yeah, man, so, he told me that uh, as soon as I bring this stuff back up there, um, man, you know, they'll have a conversation with me. We could talk about it. And then I met Jay the next, the next day, I believe. Cause I mean, I'm, you know, I don't, I don't play around. Yeah, I went and got everything I needed to get and mm -hmm. I came right back up there. And so, and then I went to the school, um, met Jay, sat down, had a conversation with him. Um, was telling him about what, what I've just come from and, you know, is there scholarship opportunities and things like that? And they were, it, it was, it was perfect timing because yeah. they was about to do a competition called Who Wants to Be a Barber, mm -hmm. right? So, um, <clears throat> Jay was like, look, I'm gonna give you a call. I don't know when we're gonna do it yet, but um, definitely want you to um, come, come down and uh, compete in the competition. And so, um, that was, that was the end of November because I started at the school December 12th. Mm. So um, I think it was around like the 26th or something like that. If I had a mm. calendar in front of me, I could tell you. Yeah, sure. But um, I went down, you know, got my models, a couple of my brothers from the street and just, you know, they came in, let me cut the hair. And um, that's when I met Dame, actually. I didn't know, I don't, I feel like I vaguely knew they was twins, mm. but I didn't really know until that day. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and he was, talking to me as if we never had a conversation before. And then he kind of made it clear, like, you know, most of y'all probably talked to my brother, Jay. And I was like, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. I, I knew mine, he was like, man, yeah. just talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. But then, you know, I, yeah. I knew from there. No. Yeah. So, but um, I mean, I, I ended up being blessed with first place. Mm -hmm. Um, Got blessed with the scholarship. Yeah. I'm, the, I'm the only one that took advantage of it. Yeah. I think I'm the only one that's taken advantage of the scholarship yeah. since then, hmm. yeah. since then, straight up. Yeah. yeah, we always know as well, so we do the who wants to be a barber contest because there's always that diamond in the rough. Mm -hmm. You never know. It's just that diamond that's just gonna show up. And we can certain things about people you could just see on them. You know what I'm saying? The desire, the hunger. Mm -hmm. And some, you know, you just you kind of miss that. You know, you could have uh, you know, you can see more in a person than they see in themselves sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh Jason was just one of the guys like he got he got it. And, and I ain't even talking about the cutting hair part. I'm talking about the mannerisms, the, the yes, energy, yes. The, you know, that that stuff that you can't teach anybody. Sure. I don't, you, I don't care if he couldn't cut hair. He, he could have did the worst haircut in the world. Sure. He still would have got that scholarship because yeah. of all those other I things presents. that you can't teach. Sure. And so that's one of the beauties of doing that competition because there is always one out there that just needs that opportunity. And, and Jason, to his, to his, uh, to his credit, man, to see what he's done in such a short period of time, I, it, it does. It, he need to really write a book. I mean, for real. And so, when did you start school? What year? 2016. 2016. Okay. Yeah. I finished in nine months. It was that I started at December. Um, now I finished September. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. He's done more in six years than people who've been out free for the last 30 years. Sure. No, that's, that's very poignant and I think just challenging the thoughts that society has, you know what I mean? Around, again, those who may have been locked up, have felonies or whatever. And it's, it's again, it's just weird, but 
it's weird, but it makes sense oh, yeah. if you think about the history of our country mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. how we progress yeah. and the the idea of throwing away people because yeah. of whether it's color of your skin, where you're from, what you got, what you don't got, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? And to see that you guys are creating, I'll call it a machine, mm-hmm. um, of being welcoming and accepting of people who maybe society has thrown away, mm-hmm. who again, got it all. They got it, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? They got it on them, they want it, you know what I mean? So. That's it's just super dope um, to hear about that. And to me, and again, how I divine bridge building mm-hmm. is someone leveraging their their power, their influence, their platform yeah. to create opportunities for others that otherwise would not have it. Yeah. And again, as you tell your story, I feel like that is what y'all are doing. That's what you've done for him and I'm sure others as well. Yeah. So I, I, even that, how does that make you feel to be able to be doing something like that. So I, 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 we think about this a lot. I think about people like Jason. His journey is is gonna go far beyond no grease. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in his in his telling his story, the book of Jason, you know, there's a small part in, in there. The Bible, man. The book yeah. of Jason. <laughs> yeah, the book of Jason. There's a small part <laughs> about. There's a, there's a small part about you know no grease and and, mm-hmm. and these two twins or Charlie and all these other people that was a part of his journey. And uh, yeah. so if if that's a feeling, I don't know, it's, it's, it's blissful, it's very blissful. Gotcha. Uh, it's uh, surreal that you've, because every time I hear a story, it's like, man, to to be a part of it. And sometimes it, how do we, I have to remove myself from it so I can actually enjoy the sure. story. Gotcha. And uh, so it's, it's, man, Jason is just an example of so many uh, people that's out there and we work with thousands of people now that I don't even, it's crazy, I don't even remember some of their names. Mm. They had to tell me, like, damn, sure. I work with y'all. I'm like, man, it's so long ago. You know, you get a 25 year stretch. They were 17 when you met them, now they, you know, 40. You're like, boy, I ain't seen you since you were 17. <laughs> you look the same. You know, you look the same, man, help me out now. Mm, uh, so it's, 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 a, it's an amazing journey, man. No. It's amazing. That is dope. So I, so I believe that if you want to call it doing the right thing, if you want to call it doing for others, typically that doesn't come without challenge, you know what I mean, mm-hmm. or opposition. Mm-hmm. And I'm always interested in my conversations of exploring what have been the challenges as well as cabinet with what do you see as the opportunities if more people took the position of creating opportunity for others. So again, we start with the challenges and I'm not gonna kick it off. I know some of the challenges you face Mm -hmm. um, with no grease, but what would you say in doing what you're doing, what are some of the oppositions, the walls that you've hit in trying to do that? So the thing, uh, again, when you catch someone who's 25, 30 years in it. Mm -hmm. uh, And real quick, also, just explore again, even how we started off this conversation. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm talking to Damien, right? Yeah. Damien, the owner of right, Love, right. and all this. Like, I'm talking to you as a human being, yeah. as a black man, yeah. as an entrepreneur, business owner. Yeah. So, explore all those dynamics. Yeah, right? every challenge you can think of, man the fear, the doubt, uh, you know, not feeling like you enough, not feeling like you know you're capable of doing something that's bigger than yourself mm-hmm. and all of that is what you're doing. I mean, you're dealing with that every single sure. day. You know, uh, when we started No Grease, we were 24 years old. And, uh, and you know, uh, you got, and I, when I take you back there, I'm, I'm, I tell people this story, like we were 24 and our mind, uh, Biggie had just died. Biggie had got mm-hmm. killed in uh, May mm-hmm. of 97. We opened up No Grease in June 97. So me and Biggie the same age. Gotcha. You know, this I'm telling you how we think. You sure. Know, damn, my one of my favorite rappers just died. Sure. You know? That's my guy. I'm 24. Maybe I'm gonna die early. Mm. So it's time to do this now. Gotcha. Don't don't play with it. This is how we feeling. Sure. Lack of better words, you know, it's us against the world. You know, two young black men. Yo, here we go. Let's do it. Sure. And you know, so you're dealing with all those things in that process. And so, you know, it was like, yo, forget our fears. Forget what people mm-hmm. are saying about us. Forget about all that stuff. Just do it. Do it now. Gotcha. And so, you know, you, you, you're you going to go through that stuff. 
you know, and it's, and then when you get to dealing with people, because mm -hmm. we're in the people business. Sure. So we got to deal with barbers first, and then we got to deal with clients. They in different places in their life. You know, you in a place in your life, and I mean, you're the therapist. We, we're the like, so we're that last. To me, we we're, we're still that that business that still has to do the human connection part. Okay. Like not only connect with them, but we have to touch them. And so all that transfer of energies happening sure. on a regular basis. And if you ain't working on yourself, you're gonna be on a roller coaster ride. Gotcha. You know what I'm saying? So I may have been on a roller coaster ride probably for the first 10, 12 years because you're not even knowing, you're not even aware of all of this that's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then going back to our background, you know, we have probably always been people of alliance. Like me and my brother, because my mother allowed us to be, and I've seen so much, you know, I've seen death close, I've seen drug addicts close, mm -hmm. and you have to allow people to kind of go through their ah, gotcha. experiences. Mm -hmm. So when I'm with these young barbers, I'm young too, I have to allow yeah, them to be, yeah. you know, I'm dealing with clients that come, I have to allow that. You know, you could try to tell people all you want, but you gotta allow some things, man. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we learned that over the years, but we was going through it though. <laughs> no, we going through it, everything. So. I hear that, I hear that. Um, so, what is it? Challenge that was very front street that uh, I definitely wanted to talk with you about it and because I didn't know you personally, but definitely, um, how would I say me? And a lot of my journey here in Charlotte, so I'm originally from Norfolk, Virginia. I've been in Charlotte since 2001. Um, and I call it from from the corner to the cul-de-sac. Yeah. My context growing up, black neighborhood, low income, what comes with that, mm -hmm. love. Again, I didn't know what I didn't have. Right. I, love, I love my childhood and how I grew up in a lot of ways. Um, 2001, flip the script. I'm moving into the cul-de-sac, South Side Charlotte, mm -hmm. more fluent, more white. Mm -hmm. um, just a lot of culture shock, a lot of shock for me. Mm -hmm. um, and my time here has, as I sum it up, I've been a black guy in a lot of white spaces, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. A lot of affluent spaces, a lot of spaces that don't understand me naturally and that in a lot of ways I don't understand them. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember because it was in the news hearing about your shop in South Park Mall. Mm -hmm. um, again, I don't know all the details, or whatever, but I just know there was some conflict or whatever you want to call it. So I don't know if you want to explain what happened there. Oh man, I love it. Man. Uh, <laughs> so you know, you, again, man, you in Charlotte? We we're the, the black business in Charlotte. We've done pretty well in Charlotte. And if you're in any space whether it's music or any, whatever space you're in, in your industry, you wanna, you wanna be, you know, you wanna be at the top of your game, sure. right? And so for the growth that we've had in Charlotte, you know, South Park was a natural maturation for us to gotcha. go into South Park. You know, uh, we had been trying to get in there for years. Mm -hmm. We had been trying to get in South Park for years. There was no opportunity there. So of course COVID happens, you know, sure. uh, a lot of businesses are, coming out of malls and they're not too successful or whatever. And we see a space in, in South Park that used to be uh, the art of shaving. Okay. And it used to be somewhat of a barbershop, but they really focus on shaving. Sure. And we, we talked to South Park like, yo, that's an opportunity. You know, it's, it's vacant. Mm -hmm. You know, let us, let us get a stab at it, right? You know, we, we did a one year contract. So the whole thing was, you know, they let us get a one year deal with them. So we signed it in December. We do the outfit of it mm -hmm. and come January, the end of January, yeah, the end of January, right before Black History Month, <laughs> they uh, they call us up and say, yo, we're going to have to, uh, you guys are going to have to shut down. We got another, uh, we got a permanent lease hmm. that wants to come in. Now, going back, we had already talked to them about a permanent lease. We wanted a permanent, we sure. never, we've never did temporary leases. Sure. So we wanted a permanent lease, but they said, no, no, no permanent lease is available. You guys can go on and do it for a year. Mind you, we, we made a nice substantial amount of an investment mm -hmm. in the upfit of it. Sure. And so we like, at least, you know, we, we got one year, we'll make our money back. 
if it doesn't work, but we was in South Park. From a marketing standpoint, it doesn't get better than that. Sure. You know, you're gonna be in South Park, you're gonna be exposed to a whole nother clientele. Sure. And they knew that, we, we told them up front, mm -hmm. cool, we'll knock out this one year, we'll show y'all who we are, right? What? So it's something that, why do you feel like, and maybe this is what I don't know about how malls work, mm -hmm. but it sounds like very much you had to prove yourself to yeah, be in there. It is like that, especially you talking about South Park. South Park is like on the top of the food chain when it comes to high end malls okay. around the country. Mm -hmm. So that's respect. That's just the game. You, okay. know, you just when you understand the game, we understood that going in. So it wasn't just paying a lease. It's like, oh, if you can pay the lease and you can be in here. It's like, nah, it's oh, okay. Nah, you in South Park. You All right, know, you gotcha. Were the, you want you were the one percenters go. You know, uh, the one percenters in Charlotte go to South Park. Okay. So you 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 on the you on the big stage. Okay. So we knew that. And that's why we 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 brought it too. Mm -hmm. So and they knew it. it was, we we had this just like me and you talking, gotcha. we had that discussion. Okay. So we get in there, we I, I mean our numbers looking good. We got Jason there, we got some of our best, we got the best of the best in there. Mm -hmm. And they give us a call up and say, you know what, uh y'all got 30 days, y'all have to close down. Wow. We got another, we got another Tenant, we're like, oh, 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 oh. Mm. 30 days. We mind you, we just, just get, talked about we just, yeah. we just talked to you. We just signed the contract in December. Mm. We just finished our upfit. We opened like the second or third of January or something mm -hmm. like that. So we, we're not even in there a full 30 days, and y'all telling us y'all got a deal. That doesn't make sense. I mean, that deal had to be going on mm. prior. Prior. That okay. doesn't make sense. And so we made a couple of phone calls to, to, to people we know in the media, to people we know, and it just, hmm. it was a firestorm. And, uh, you know, the people responded the way they responded. But, you know, Jason, Jason was there. Jason, Jason, along with the other barbers, they had to hold it down and, and figure out that part while we was behind the scenes hmm. trying to figure out the other side. So Jason got a better you know, he got a different perspective of what was going on on his side mm -hmm. as opposed to what was going on on our side. So. Gotcha. Yeah, so I mean, for me, I'm aware of, you know, the the presence that South Park has in Charlotte. You know, I mean, that's that's old money Charlotte. You know, if you was getting it back then, if you helped build the city, that's where you live <laughs> sure, at, right. you know? So when we got in there, um, we knew that we had hit a, a we crossed over a bridge, gotcha. you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. when, when it comes to the barber industry, um, black yeah. business. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was a blessing just to be in there, mm -hmm. you know? Um, we was able to utilize that opportunity greatly in where we are now, just as a, a barber shop, a barber business. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when, when, when I heard the news, it was like, wow, like, we ain't been in here but a few weeks. Like, <laughs> what are we talking about? We can take over the space. I know what we're capable of. You sure. know what I mean? I know that we can we can take this on permanently. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about bringing in a permanent leaseholder. Um, so, you know, of course, um, there was a lot of, like, news being generated about the, the issue, right? Sure. And so, you know, I, I cut a guy from the news and he comes and he's like, hey, you know, you think we could, you know, you could you could plug me in with one of the brothers and, and, and we could do a story on this. And 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 the beautiful thing that I saw in it all, I'm gonna tell you this right here, was the way that they handled it. You know, the cool. way that they controlled the narrative uh, of what was going on. Gotcha. You know, not to just just you know come at them forcefully, mm -hmm. you know, with with the backing that I know was there, mm -hmm. or to even you know, paint a, a dim picture over who they are in the way that they doing business. Mm -hmm. But it was more about controlling the narrative of, you know, how we would want to exit. Yeah. You know, we want to do this with, with honor, with dignity. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was a conversation that we were all having, like yeah. in the heat of the moment. And um, because it was like two options there. Like, I mean, we can, we can come and we can call some some big hitters in, and we can you know go ahead call and call Al Sharp. Yeah, 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 you know all that. Yeah, and, and I mean people was ready to rally yeah. on on the real. Like you got plenty of people wow. around here. The, the no grease has been such a a big influence in Charlotte and and a presence in Charlotte for such a long time, especially for the black community. It's like you know you got everybody calling, people talking about it on their radio shows and. 
You know, I remember hearing No Limit Larry talking about it on on, on the radio yeah. and, and everything because it's, it's, it's a big deal. And nobody wanted to see us get pushed out. Yeah. That, even that is interesting. Um, and which, which way do I want to go first? I want to hear, I won't go here first, but I want to come back and I want to hear from your perspective as you mentioned, it's just black culture, black business, mm. and you existing within this world, where you sit and how you sit within mm. that world. So I remember, I wanna come back to that because I wanna hear it. <laughs> yeah. um, again, even again, who I mentioned earlier, Mike Sheldon is a white guy. Mm. And the way I put it is like, you know, I got black friends who are culturally white. And I have some white friends who are culturally black. Mike Sheldon's one of those guys yeah. to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. But before we go there, I am, I don't I don't think the word is impressed. It's like saying you're articulate. It's like, what does that mean? Um, but I appreciate the way you talk about how it's handled. You know what I mean? Whether it was with honor or dignity, whatever. Because you did not do that. Not at all. You know what I mean? And I would say, I can't say typically it's not handled, but what you typically hear about in the news, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to a race component, yeah, man, he is he not would have ate that up. Right? right, it's not handled that way. So I'm very much interested in why did did y'all have something to? Did you say, hey, if you're gonna cover it, I want you to cover it a certain way, right. or nah. then no? So it's funny, man. I, I, as when we had these conversations, I start to reflect. It was it was those years building up to that moment mm -hmm. that prepared us. Uh, even when I I'm talk I'm I'm seriously I'm talking about everything I can remember as a young man watching uh, Malcolm, watching King, watching these guys how they carried themselves in front of a camera. You mm -hmm. know how they was poised, how they were you know they were very uh, aware of the words that they were using. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, man, that's what we understood. It was Charlotte, yeah, I got met. Black Lives Matter was off the chain mm -hmm. at that time. We, we early 2021. Sure, yeah. Everybody ready to burn everything down. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So that mindset, and we know we've never been about that. We've always been about, you know, building bridges mm -hmm. and connecting people. And we just look at it as an opportunity. This is an opportunity to have a respectful conversation about why would y'all make that decision? Mm -hmm. That doesn't make, that's not good business sense. Not why would you, sure. why would you do that? You know, and they couldn't really explain it. Like sure. that didn't, that doesn't, that's not good business. Mm -hmm. And we kind of kept it right there. We didn't even get into the black and white thing because sure. that would be a speculator. Mm -hmm. Sure. We didn't know why they made that decision. Mm -hmm. you, you could assume a lot of things, but from what we got from them was they found another sure. permanent lease, which still didn't make sense to us. So we just kept it, we kept it business and all those experiences that we had up until that point, it helped us navigate through those things. And we were, we were mentored for years by the community and we wanted to respect the community because sure. we've been, we've been, you know, black, black, you know what I'm saying? So we couldn't, we couldn't start stepping and fetching now. We sure. couldn't be shucking and jiving. Sure. Like, this master, no, nah, <laughs> hell no, we weren't gonna do none of that. Sure. So we had to, we had to do it in a way that the community respected too. And, and, and we could we could sleep good at night. Like, yo, we represented our business, we represented the community, and that's that was our approach. That was our approach, bro. No, that's, again, man, honor, honorable way to handle things. And uh, I even appreciate the, if you would say, not assuming certain things. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And as I would put it, it's like, you know, you can ask the questions you have and allow them to ponder them within themselves. Yeah. You know what I mean? Again, that's around the table. That's for me, that's for everybody. Yeah. Like, yo, I should not be offended by a question. Right. But if I'm offended by it, maybe there's something going on. Yeah. You know what I mean? How I respond to that, yeah. maybe there's actually something else going right. on. Right. Um, so no, that's that's super dope that you all would do that. And to your point, I do see uh, very much, and I think also when it comes to bridge building, I think a lot of times we can stereotype, like, they're just white hand, old black hands, mm -hmm. like that. Maybe sometimes, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I believe what you're doing with the school, with the shop, is building bridges within your own community as well. And again, not not limiting who can, but very much you're, you seem to be focused on, these are the people, I, this is who I grew up with. These yeah. are the people who need opportunity. Yeah. Um, while also South Park, is like 
you are creating opportunity, not just within your own community. It's yeah. like, no, create an opportunity for you to get exposure in this community right. as well. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which I also see is you're creating opportunity for that community to be exposed to what you do Absolutely. as well, which is just as valuable. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. no. Absolutely. That's dope. Yeah. That's dope. So real, real quick, I love to, again, just from a black culture, barbershop, um, lens, how do you position yourself within this world? How, what, what, what is your outlook on, and I'm not even gonna put it, a lot, I feel like sometimes we communicate as, this is your place, and I, I don't subscribe to that. It's yeah. like, no, we say that because of, again, the history of, you belong here because you the skin, you belong there. It's like, nah, mm -hmm. I don't subscribe to that. But you being able to be in the midst and experience the culture of no grease and how entrenched it is in black culture. What is that like for you? I feel like home. <laughs> okay. I feel like home. Okay. So, uh, and you're from New Jersey originally, right? I'm from Philly originally. Philly, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so, I mean, growing up, I mean, we're talking about black and Spanish kids. I'm so I'm half Filipino okay. and half Spanish. Okay. All right? uh, disregard the last name. Well, that's a whole other story. <laughs> but um, my mother is. I'm a first generation American in my okay. family. My mother's okay. from the Philippines, born and raised. Um, I don't know my father, right? So the Spanish culture that I was exposed to was that that I was around in the street, okay. right? So when you talk about the people I was with in the street, it was black and Spanish, okay. right? And then maybe it was some culturally white type kid, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it was like, I grew up in 90s hip hop era, you know, I'm 85, mm -hmm. right? So like, those are my influences growing up. Yeah. So, um, man, I grew up close in Caribbean families, black families, Spanish families. When I'm at home, it's Filipino, right? But it's still not, I'm just, you know, I'm, so I'm, I'm reaching from everywhere, sure. right? So I'm exposed to everything. And and I know growing up, I didn't see it because mm -hmm. just, it just feel like this is how I live. Um, but as I got older, I started seeing the, the impact that it had on who I was becoming as a man mm -hmm. and um, how I could, you know, kind of jump in and out of different cultures and be, mm -hmm. be good. Mm -hmm. And so um, it definitely has played to my favor um, growing up. Gotcha. But... Uh, so, I mean, I've always been in black culture. You gotcha. know what I mean? I go, even though I might go to my family house Thanksgiving, like I'm going to my brother's crib up the street for Thanksgiving too. So I'm I'm getting, I'm not just getting, you know, sure. what's over here, I'm, sure. I'm getting everything, you know? So, uh, so when, when I came to know Greece, I mean, culturally, like just, it was just home, you know? I actually get I, I actually get flat from that like when so just and just to make it even a little more clear like when you get when you go to prison right if you go to prison there's a lot of segregation in prison okay. so to speak black Spanish white and so I was always the Spanish mixed Asian guy right okay. that was always with more black people than anything okay. so I would get I'm going to break bread with black guys when, if we if we cooking right and my my Spanish dude like oh yeah you know come come in you know throw in I'm like I'm already throwing in over here and I mean I'd always I'd always they they say something about it you know mm -hmm. what I mean mm -hmm. but it was like you know at that time yeah, I mean it really didn't matter to me anyways but you know it's it's just funny how that thing works because. You'll, you'll get flack from your other, from your culture yeah. about what you're doing and, and how you're approaching life and stuff like that. I heard it from, you know, my grandparents who are, you know, now my mother grew up in the Philippines, right? But she came to the States when, you know, she was, she was a late teenager, right? Mm -hmm. um, she had me at 20. And so now my grandparents, I mean, they whole life, Filipino culture. So like, they were always like, oh, you don't need to be doing this, going there, mm -hmm. this place. And I'm like, that's not how I live my life. I don't live my life how you live it, you know? Gotcha. And so, you know, being around, I mean, black people, so to speak, has always felt like home. So I felt at home when I came to No Greece. Yeah. When I was learning about the culture and 
you know, the mission behind, the heart behind everything, you know, I was right where I was supposed to be at. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Jason was always, he was just natural. You know, any anytime you, we've all been in situations, well, I don't know, we've all, but you know, if you're a minority in, in America, we've always been in a situation when we're the minority. Like sure. it's one of us and there's 10 of everybody else. Sure. And to see how Jason moved, it, it never, you can say, it's just natural. Mm -hmm. You don't, you know, when people are like, man, that's Jason. Like Jason's Jason. I know he has to battle with certain things. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily battle, has to deal with certain things because, you know, he got beautiful family, he got his family, he got friends. And, then all these black guys would be around him. Then he could be around all these Spanish guys or white guys. I'm like, man, that's enjoy, <laughs> enjoy that experience sure. to be able to kind of move and 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 I think allowance, man. Again, allow people be be themselves. And you know, Jason just so happens <laughs> he listened to more rap music than me. I don't even listen to that much rap music. He, he know more about certain things that I know. So sure. it's just this it's was a natural fit. And he just walks in that he. He walks in, I never, people who are that close to us, I never even think twice because they've been who they are from mm -hmm. the very beginning. Sure. So he's going to continue to be him. No, it's funny what you're talking, a couple words thinking about is uh, identity because what it sounds like is Jason is comfortable being himself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he ain't stepping in the picture. <laughs> he, he ain't putting the black face on. And I think I there's know. a lot of respect with that because mm -hmm. um, I think Again, depending on who you are, you may have been met um, throughout time, meaning communities, with the idea of you have to be, you know, as a as a black woman, you have to have your hair straightened, you know what I mean? Blonde, blue eyed, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think when, whether that's you or that's not you, being able to stand in who you are yeah. is attractive, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. no, I want to be around that person because they mass secure in who they are, yeah. um, regardless of how that looks. Yeah. Um, so there's much respect for that. And I'm, I guess I asked you the question because I'm always interested and I forget who said this, but it's with, it was within the context of I think gentrification mm -hmm. and the idea of, you want to say stolen black, brown space. Mm -hmm. um, and Someone spoke about it. So I don't remember who it was. It's like, you know, it depends on who and what is being done with the space. Yeah, yeah. And on the side that I never thought about, it's like, no, it's like, if they're coming to appreciate and to build up what exists, that's not gentrification. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And yeah. what I hear from your story is like, no, this has always been home. You know what I mean? And when it comes to existing within the black, I mean, the no grease culture, black culture within the barbershop is like, no, this is home. I love this and I want to invest in this and I want to build it up yeah. rather than take from it, you right. know what I mean, for it. So that's, that's super dope. Um, so <laughs> I would like to explore real quick. If you had to sum up in a sentence or two, both of you, I want to hear from you. What do you believe could exist opportunities wise? if more people use their power influence to create bridges like you're doing like how would you challenge other barber shops what could exist if they were bridge building other barbers like what could exist if they existed or use their platform to connect people create opportunities for others uh I, i'll start uh so i think you know the dreams that we all have that could exist. Like, you know, we really could grow, you know, the spaces and places we live. If mm -hmm. we just uh, <clears throat> take control the narrative, control the narrative of what we want to see happen. Mm -hmm. Like now that I'm in at this place in my life, I like, yo, for the next 30 years, you know, I'm the elder or I'm the leader sure. that people would be looking at. And what do I want for my kids, mm -hmm. for my family to see? and really believe what I see and make those things happen. Using the barber industry in, in the way that we've used it. I mean, we're so thankful and grateful that we it was sitting there for us to use. Mm -hmm. And we created this platform for people to kind of express themselves and be themselves and not feel threatened like it's, some, it's, like it's not enough. It's sure. more than enough. We got more than enough. Okay. There's no lack. There's no, 
you know, someone's going to get more than you. But no, you're going to get exactly what it is that you're looking for mm -hmm. in this life. And the more we can create those platforms so people can not, the competing, if we compete and it should be, I'm better in myself, you're better in yourself in the competition. Sure. Not that I'm taking something from you or you're taking something from me. Gotcha. We're competing because we want to better each other. Sure. That's it. In business, in, in sports or whatever you want to do, it's I'm competing because I'm trying to be a better me. Gotcha. And if, if you stop looking at things as some type of lack, some type of someone's taking something from you, nah, if, if, if another barbershop is doing what we're doing and they're doing it better, I'm like, I'm, I want to learn from them. Like, how can we be better? Hmm. You know, not competition, gotcha. you taking something from me. I think when we start looking at things like that, this this experience that we're having here, man, it, it will be just amazing. It will be amazing. I like that. I like that. How about you, Jason? Um, it's kind of just picking off, piggybacking off kind of where Dame started. I mean, if, if you're a contributor to society opposed to a taker mm -hmm. to society, I mean, you're, you're creating, you know, better community. Yeah. Right. So if if I'm somebody that's coming in looking for what I'm owed all the time, mm -hmm. you know, no matter where you come from, mm -hmm. like you're not going to be someone that's contributing to anybody's life. Yeah. Right. You're taking away from your own life hmm. because you reap what you sow out here. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I'm not sowing good fruit, if I'm not, you know, loving my neighbor as myself. Right. Mm -hmm. If I'm not preferring someone better than me. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I'm just always looking out for for Jason and what's best for me, what I can get out of this situation. I mean, I'm not gonna make it, but so far, I'm gonna be holding myself back, right? From anything that God might have for me on that, on the other side of that bridge. Mm -hmm. And if more people could just, you know, be comfortable in that, like look for where you can serve, look for where you can contribute. And I mean, it's gonna create, you know, a, a greater wholeness mm -hmm. In, in everything around us, you know what I mean? Because, I mean, people are people, hmm. you know? We all just, I mean, we, we desire a lot of the same things. Yep. You know, we desire a lot of the same things for our families, sure. for, you know, for our, our generation coming before us, coming behind us. I, I mean, you know, hmm. but if we trying to take it all the time, look, you ain't gonna have nothing to give. <laughs> no, that's, that's dope. And if I had to, some of what I believe I'm hearing from you too, it's the idea of, how do I say, uh, moving away from competition. Mm -hmm. um, and you're seeing the reality that the existence of others can actually make you better mm -hmm. and make us better collectively. Um, no, that's dope. Yeah. I appreciate that, I appreciate that. So before I let y'all go, I got a gift for the both of you. All right. So this is my bridge builder motivational journal awesome it is 52 weeks and it's autographed too uh, um, <laughs> it's 52 weeks of motivational quotes <laughs> reflection items as well as action items for those who are serious about shifting their own mental mm -hmm. um, so they can actually lead in a more how would I say impactful way and right. creating opportunity for others. So I'm ready that. that's who you got. I appreciate get that. this. I'm gonna yeah. purchase some for all the barbers. Yeah. Work? Yeah. I got it. Appreciate it. it.